What is up Rad Potential YouTube and welcome to today's video. In this video, we're not going to be working on a rotary engine car, albeit there are going to be some pretty sweet rotary engine things in the video that you guys should keep your eyes open for. I'm going to walk you guys through the process of converting what used to be two lean-tos with dirt floors from an old barn. I'll put a picture up right now of what this ranch, what the Rad Ranch used to look like back in the day whenever my great grandpa and the guy who started this farm were friends and how I converted it into an automobile build awesome cars workshop. So we're gonna start on the outside. As you can tell, look at all that fresh Galvalum sheet metal. So my friend Todd and his family their contracting company, Exteriors LLC, they specialize in building pole barns, decks, anything, you name it. Was able to get them out here on short notice and effectively waterproof and improve the outside of my building and seal it up. So if you remember from the very beginning, this big wall right here where my sliding door is, was all open. The wall right here with all this new 10 behind the RX-8 in the truck looked like a Rolls-Royce Starry Night headliner. It had a ton of rust holes, a ton of nail holes in it, and that is no shape for a shop where you want to effectively heat this thing from the inside. So in addition to framing out this door, reskinning this side of the building, we've got new trim. I had them add a 12 by 44, so the length of my big section of the shop is 44 feet long. So this is a one-sided with the roof lean-to, long enough for a two-car enclosed trailer. So what they did up here is they cut the metal down at the top. So they cut the metal down at the top, added a new header board, spanned the roof to new posts, and the roof line of this lean-to actually follows the roof line of the existing shop. So it's really funny because this shop is actually two old lean-tos from what used to be a big barn. So walking around to the front here, this lean-to that I have added, effectively where this new lean-to is at, used to be the old barn. So if you can imagine, back to that original picture, some big, beautiful, arched, big roof, old barn. Unfortunately, didn't quite last the test of time and the barn got torn down, but the lean-tos, which were added at a later date, to which I have now rehabbed remained. So on the front of the building, this is still the original sheet metal here. So when they tore that barn down, they put new metal on the open walls of what was left over. And I have added an 18 foot by what is 50 feet long lean to here. So coming out to this side of the building, you're gonna see kind of maybe getting a feel for the building that was there. So I had like an L. So what we've added off to the right, you know, the roof lines aren't exactly the same because I wanted this side to be about 12 feet high so you could drive like a taller tractor or our bulldozer or something through there. But I've mirrored the side here where my little rotary truck is to the right. So this is 17 by 50. And this side is 18 by 50, so almost a mirror. I could definitely foresee in the future, kind of like the next expansion, once I need more space, would be to concrete and enclose this side and put a door on this end. Or, you know, we could pull one of the posts, put a brace up, put a door in from the north side. So that is basically the extent of the exterior modifications. In addition to modifying the building, I had to modify the grade around the building. So my day job, what I used to do before I effectively became an on-call employee for civil engineering was exactly what I had to do here. So grading, one of the most important parts before you redevelop, develop, build a house is you need to understand where the water goes on your site. So go there in a big rainstorm, get out your rain jacket and your big boots see where the water's running, see where you have puddles, see which direction the creek flows if you have a creek, etc., etc. You need to understand the water patterns around your building before you even really consider 
by dumping a bunch of money into the building itself. You don't want to build a building and have a bunch of water flooded. So right where that roof is right there on this corner of the building, I had a big soft spot where the road was definitely of higher elevation. And if you can imagine this lean-to in this old barn, the barn would have been at the high point, the water would have flown, flowed away. But with that lean-to just having livestock in it, it didn't really matter that it got a little muddy under there until it was enclosed. So I brought out the big dozer, which y'all saw at the old rat ranch down in Nashville. It's back up here. And I clipped this hill, and you can see from the roof effectively to me, now water is flowing towards the camera. So that corner there, albeit is still going to catch a little bit of water. The road, everything from this whole side of the building is gonna to drain to the south and it is all gonna run underneath all of my parts cars, eventually down here into the creek. So take care of your drainage. In addition to the huge investment into reskinning the building, if you're gonna build something, be prepared to dump some money on the ground in rock. So this is probably, I think maybe six tri-axle truckloads of rock in order to get this building from the start, which was dirt floors, to now. So moving to the inside, because you're like, oh, it doesn't look like six tri-axle truckloads of rock out here. Well, trust me, you get this stuff built up, got to provide a good foundation for a concrete Floor. My good buddy Craig and his dad came out with J&J &J Sander Concrete and knocked out this floor for me. The important thing about a shop floor that you need to know before you have your concrete guys come out here and do this is how thick you need it to be and what machinery you're going to be pulling into your shop. My floor here is 6 inches thick and I have a 20 inch deep footer along the entrance of the building. The reason for that, knowing that I wasn't initially going to have a big concrete apron out here or a concrete driveway, in addition to wanting to drive my bulldozer in here, that footer prevents the slab from kicking up back like in front of the RX-8. If I drove that bulldozer on this leading edge of the concrete, it's going to push that down and the back of the slab is going to pop up. Even with six inch thick concrete, that's most likely to happen. There is rebar and reinforcement and everything in this floor as well. So that footer prevents that. The six inches is so that the weight of that, which is 20,000 pounds, doesn't excessively crack the concrete anywhere else. In addition, I knew that I wanted to have a two post lift that would lift my dually pickup truck. So this truck is 9,000 pounds. I need a 12,000 pound lift. If you're going to have a 12,000, even a 10,000 and up pound lift, you're going to need six inches of concrete at the base of the lift. Now, you could get away with doing just concrete footers for the lift itself, where the posts go, and have four inches thick elsewhere. But the main area of my shop has six inches of concrete. So we could pull the dozer in here, whip some donuts, drive it out. It's not going to hurt the floor. Moving to the engine room, the hangout room, whatever you want to call it. Over here, this is actually a section of the separate longer lean-to, the, the long edge of the L, let's say. So big, tall, short edge of the L, long edge of the L. So I made a square in here. This is 17 by 17. Concrete is four inches thick. I didn't anticipate driving a car on this at all. So when they poured it at this break in the concrete right here, is four inches. I think that ought to hold up plenty of engines. If we ever have like a big block Chevy or a Hemi or something, it'll be fine on an engine stand in here. It's not going to hurt it. So moving back this way while we're just talking floor coverage and then we'll work back into the inside of the building and talk about insulation. This side I opted to leave rock. Now the main reason for that, and this is what you're going to have to decide when you're building your building or rehabbing a building from the inside out like I did, is that you need to assess the existing structure of your building and make sure that it's worth it to pour concrete on the inside of it. So the, one of the reasons I didn't want to concrete this whole side is because this lean-to was definitely older than the other one. The posts, a little bit less structurally sound, a little bit more rotten at the bottom than the other one. 
So I only wanted to kind of minimize my risk of investment by pouring a small slab over there. That gives me like an area outside of the cars where they park to be able to build engines and stuff. But the rest of the building, worth it. This side, not so much. So let's talk about working on insulating, fixing up your building from the inside out. Now that we can see what my building looked like before I fixed it up. So the whole place was effectively dirt floor, grade boards, the metal comes down almost to the dirt, but not quite. So you can see some residual bird markings in here. Still see some holes up there that are caulked shut, which is fine, at least on this side of the building. Not a huge worry for some leaks. You can see the lights. But what you can most importantly see is that there is no vapor barrier. There is no wrap. There is no nothing on this building, or at least as it was. It is literally steel metal on the purlins, on the posts, right here. Metal, purlins, posts. Not ideal for something that you want to convert to like a barn dominium or even a workshop, right? So if you look on this side, this is the new wall, the new metal. This is a building wrap. So it's like a tarp, effectively. But what that does is that contains the moisture that's going to accumulate between the metal and your building. So if you can imagine the back side of this steel, you can see the little ribs right here. The back side of that steel, as the metal heats up, temperatures change, etc., etc., there's going to get some you're going to get some moisture in there. The vapor barrier keeps the moisture on the outside of the vapor barrier of the wrap, right? Not on the inside. So, how do you combat that when you want to insulate your building from the inside out, especially on a roof just like this? So coming in here, you can see for my walls right here that I went and bought some closed cell insulation boards. Let me show you what they look like out here. So this is kind of my, whoop, this is my leftover closed cell insulation. So you can see here, it's just like spray foam, but it's sprayed between like aluminum foil. Some of them have this like refrigerator stuff backing on them. Some of them are, this is what's called ox board. You can actually buy this at the store. You can see the R values there is three for a half inch, six for one inch. A lot of the stuff I put in my building was like inch and a half. So I was able to find a bunch of this board used. So it's kind of a little bit messy, but I found a bunch of it used up in Illinois, drove up there, bought a bunch of it, saved a ton of money. My walls, that aux board, insulation board, is mounted straight to the purlins. So any moisture that's going to accumulate between my insulation and the metal is going to stay on the outside of the insulation. So closed cell foam like that is waterproof. So it's your vapor barrier. If you tape the seams all shut, then you wouldn't get water into your building. It would function just like a building wrap. So because I couldn't take all the metal off and wrap it and then put it back together, I didn't want to. That was how I did the walls of the building all the way up to the roof. So if you look up at the roof here, it's a little bit more complex than the walls because of the moisture issue. So what you're looking at is a clear four mil plastic, much like what you would put down when you're painting a house when you don't want to get paint on the floor. I stapled the clear four mil plastic to the bottom of the purlins for the entirety of the roof. I did not staple it down the center line between the two trusses. So here the trusses are just like a two by 12 and a two by 12. So I would have stapled it along this edge and this edge. And what that is gonna do is any moisture that accumulates between the metal and that plastic is gonna get caught up in the plastic. And as the plastic runs down to the wall, here at the interface between my wall insulation and the roof insulation, the wall insulation holds the plastic up. So the moisture will run down behind the wall insulation, effectively between the steel and my wall insulation. And what that will do is that will keep the moisture out of the building. So in order to insulate the ceiling under that vapor barrier, I got some of that pink 
fiberglass insulation. My uncle, when they remodeled the showroom at our farm machinery dealership here in Huntingburg, Indiana, they had all of that fiberglass stuff laying in their ceiling. So if you build a ceiling in your building, like at the bottom of these trusses, you put a flat ceiling in, you just lay that fiberglass on top, you leave the metal exposed, you know, there's enough ventilation in there that the moisture doesn't accumulate or what little does the fiberglass will catch it. So they pulled all that old fiberglass out, was able to score a ton of it effectively for get rid of it price. And I wanted to use that in the roof because the most important part when you're insulating a building, all your heat is going to go up. So I have a wood stove to heat this place. Heat's going to want to go out the roof. The thicker insulation you can put on the roof, generally, the better it's going to hold heat in. So one and a half inches up the walls to two inches or so, so about an R value of six. The roof has an R value of 20. It has six inches of that fiberglass. So getting that fiberglass up there, Calvin came out and helped me, and it was huge having his help because effectively all of these boards you see, the fresh boards up here that run long ways in the shop, okay? We, I put those up, then we snaked the insulation in and I used this six mil thick black plastic to hold that insulation up. Now, there is still a little bit of a gap between the pink insulation and the vapor barrier, which is fine, and that six mil plastic is stapled all the way down the trusses. What I didn't wanna do was put a ceiling in here. I really like the way these trusses look. I like the open ceiling feel, and I didn't wanna take away from the character of this, you know, lean-to, what's left of it. So that was kind of an unintrusive way to insulate the ceiling of it, albeit a super pain in the butt to get installed. And I very much appreciate Calvin helping me get that done. This way. Working on rehabbing this old barn, let me tell you, it's cold, but I have to give a mad thanks to Calvin for, silly. for spending a school night, AKA a work night yeah, here, cool. helping me get this insulation done. So up above, you can see in the engine room here, we've got the vapor barrier up. Out here, this is the finished product for six and a half inches of insulation in the ceiling. It's very late. I don't have my stove pipe fixed up yet. It's probably 30 degrees. It's frosty outside. And it is less than 30. frosty. So, got the insulation done. Back to the rest of the video. So with the insulation done, let's talk about the walls and my big sliding door. Y'all might ask, why do we have a sliding door? Okay, and sliding doors don't effectively seal that well, which is true. But the access, the accessibility of this building was important for me. If I had multiple spaces, bigger buildings here, there, everywhere, then I could have put a smaller door on the space where I was just gonna work on cars. But like I said earlier, we might work on the bulldozer in here. We might need to pull the 1466 in here with a cab and pop the duels off. So the bottom of these rafters to the concrete floor is 12 foot three inches. This door is 12 feet tall by 12 feet wide. With the rafters being as short as they were, I could not get a 12 foot tall overhead door. So one of the doors is gonna go like this without having to modify the trusses or do a shorter door. So I knew I wanted 12 foot tall. Now you can back a trailer, a camper, anything like that into your building. What Todd, contractor, did for me is we actually have, this is a rubber seal for an overhead door mounted on the inside of the sliding door. When the door slides closed and then you cinch it back with these brackets here get you some light so when the door slides closed you flip the bracket out it latches in like that you pull it and you can see the door moves in right so when the door gets sucked in that rubber piece effectively seals to the fleeting edge of the concrete now I'm gonna go through here and put some like foam tape on these rails so that whenever it seals in and seals tightly against this piece of treated wood right here, the foam's gonna make up the gap. I would say that's just as sealed 
maybe not quite as good as like a really high quality overhead door, but very good for a sliding door. Now, these sliding doors, mine is the thickness of a two by six, right? So I've got some inch and a half thick insulation and I'm gonna lay that in to all the channels on the inside of this door. So y'all can see right here, vapor barrier, purlins that the metal is mounted to, I can insulate the gap in between there. And I would say, you know, at our other farm, the doors are made out of two by fours, framed, you know, very thick, three and a half inches thick. So you could put mega insulation in that door, but those doors are also super heavy and they protrude from the building really far, you know, because they're four inches thick effectively, right? So this door, lower profile, works well, pretty light. You know, I would say like, an eight-year-old might struggle to move it, but you can pretty much move the door pretty freely. It hangs really nicely, the wheels and stuff up in the track. From the door, let's look at the walls. Y'all might recognize this, you might not, but this is my mural from the basement of my house. So, had this painted. My Corvette used to sit in my basement on the carpet. The guardrail gave you the feeling that, you know, you're on this backcountry road. Got the Batman building from Nashville in there. Got a crane from my civil engineering stuff. Big old mountain in the middle. A little bit more of an abstract, you know, rainbow style look. But I wanted to use that in here. I only had to cut about six inches off of it. So that's plywood, eight feet tall. Some 3 8 OSB trimming out the bottom, which will get painted black with the brown like braces for the guardrail. You know, this is just like a guardrail that like a Slam Miata could drive under. But OSB is effectively my walls so what you see gray here osb whiteboard it's screwed right on top of the insulation i've got to do more osb back there but you can see you know me patching some slivers together for this back section don't worry my banner's not going to stay here i just needed to get all the rolls out of it from moving so that's osb all the way around the reason for that this insulation if you just like drop a Let's just say this little FD hood prop right here, right? If you take this hood prop and it falls over, sorry, Richard, I'm gonna drop your hood prop. And it hits the OSB, all it does is scratch my paint. But, where's the exposed insulation piece that I'm not too worried about and y'all can get mad at me for doing this. But, effectively, if I drop this hood prop and it hits the insulation, it's gonna nick it. So. If you know you're going to be sliding jacks, jack stands, welders around, put something to cover your insulation. The workbench. Two by fours, treated lumber under the cabinet bottoms so that I can hose my shop out without ruining these semi-cheap leftover cabinet bottoms. So these cabinets and cabinet bottoms came from a doctor's office whenever it got remodeled. They were going to get rid of all this stuff, snagged it all. We're going to use it here, same with the cabinets and stuff in there, so just plaster it up. I know it's not white or metal or super necessarily garage friendly, but cheap to free, must use. So, oh, that one's empty. I'm going to show you some cool stuff. So I got my wiring in here, cabinets, nothing fancy, right? Not even soft clothes cabinets, you know? But I'm a tall guy, so I elevated my workbench up five and a half inches. Same with the one in there. So that way when I'm looking at a carburetor, I don't have to be down here doing what I gotta do to work on it or working on my little four cylinder block or even messing with my injector cleaner. So behind this, I had planned on doing OSB, but we had a little bit of leftover metal. So this is the same tin that's on the outside of my building right here. And I'm gonna cut some slivers, do that metal tin in here and do the metal tin down here. So that way, whenever I'm trying to drop a hood prop and damage my insulation, it doesn't hurt it. In addition, I may, I think that corner will probably get OS speed, but cabinets make for good displays as well. So got some twin Solex McCunies up there, little FCRX7 turbo, my set of plastic louvers that I'm pretty sure if I put these on my RX7 that if I went any speed over 30 miles an hour, they would explode and fly off, but they look good up there. I sold 7 MGE valve cover, like, or timing cover from my Supra. All the rotors, all the rotors on the wall because they're art, might as well display them. Wood stove, 
This is the engine room workbench. So I apologize for the lighting. Part two of this video is going to be electrical, plumbing, kind of my water system I'm going to figure out because I've got well water, my air system, etc., etc. Plumbing my stove pipe. But I want to kind of give you a little rundown of this room too. So same thing, used cabinet bottoms through here, raised it up five and a half inches. These are actually countertops from the same office. I knocked off the backsplash trim over here, kept it over there. Whiteboards, because we got to draw stuff. Another whiteboard behind the light, which you can't see. I've got like a glass display cabinet to go here, which will look pretty nice, just with some like trinket stuff and eventually maybe some trophies or posters and stuff up here on the wall as we do cool things. Two of my Volk Ray's Engineering meshy wheels that I want to have restored for something, the old Rad Ranch sign. But this wall wasn't here. So I framed this out myself. I am not by any means a super good contractor, but it's anchored to the floor. It's got treated wood at the bottom. Fortunately, Calvin and his dad are building Calvin's new shop right now. So I went over and learned a good bit about framing. So I just kind of knocked this out myself. Got it all tied in, got it insulated. And this is, you can see that pink batting here. And this is effectively what's done on the roof, but just under the black plastic, right? But built that wall. So this room is 17 by 17. So that's your four inch thick concrete, 17 by 17, little table eating lunch and stuff. The coolest part about this space is that I left this open, kind of like a little bar, a little hangout area. So I've got some bar stools to put here. This barn wood, which is from one of my friend's barns in Kentucky that they torn down, that they tore down at his hog farm. I had this on my bar in my fraternity house, then I had it on the bar in my basement at my house in Nashville, and now it's on the bar in the shop. But barn wood trims it out nice. You could sit here and watch me build an engine if my friends wanted to come out and hang out. But I think the coolest part, one of my favorite things about the whole space, and the lights aren't really on enough to show you, but you can kind of see it, is this polygon right here is old sheet metal from the old barn. So the old barn was actually this whole space from where my door is to where the stove is was actually a wall and these two lean-tos were separate. You had to get into that side from the little tiny door over there, and then this side was all open. So because that's still interior, I don't have to insulate it or cover it up, so I like having that little look over there. I'm going to put some accent lights or some little things hanging down or something, maybe have a little sign painted that says the engine room. But I think it turned out to be a super neat space, and I really wanted to film this video specifically so that I could go over the more technical aspects of building this barn from the inside out and how I kind of managed, you know, adapting it to something that would otherwise have been like super easy to just build a new one and have white, beautiful walls and insulation everywhere and vapor barrier and the whole deal um, versus kind of like what I did, which is what I thought was the fastest way for me to get a space to work on these cars before the winter hit, which eight weeks, eight weeks ago, this was a dirt floor. So, you know, super happy with, you know, all the guys that helped, um, Craig and John, Todd, Tim, you know, super happy with all of them coming out and, and getting this done for me. And, and it turned out amazing, but I felt like it needed its own video to show you guys if anybody was out there that had an old barn on their property I'm like ah, I might just tear it down and build a new one that there is some hope for you know fixing something out from the inside out um, we'll see how this holds up you know to the test of time I, I guarantee you it's not gonna last you know hundreds and whatever's of years but you know an average pole barn people say the life people say the lifespan of a pole barn is probably 40 to 50 years before the poles start getting rotten and stuff starts going so you know this structure Everything seemed really solid, so hopefully we can get that same amount of life out of it. In addition, if we ever got to put a new roof on it, the insulation's not spray foam, so the roof can come off. We can put a new one on. As far as the side metal, everything's in good shape, and I have a perfect lean-to up front to add more concrete. So with that, welcome to the new Rad Ranch, guys. I'm super stoked. As you can tell, I've started moving stuff in. It's the RX-8. That car rotary trucks out there all my engine parts and stuff are here the old metal tables here 
Part two of the overhaul in the shop series is going to be electrical. I'm running my airlines from the compressor way back in the back out to here with kind of how I'm going to set that manifold up and such. In addition to, I've got a well here and I want to set up some sort of a water system so that I, I can have, you know, a sink and maybe have enough that I can potentially wash a car out here. Fortunately, I only have my driveway as rock and that is a chip and seal road out there. So I don't have to drive down a gravel road and get everything dirty, but it would be nice to be able to wash some stuff. So let's uh, get back to making videos and building cars and enjoying a beautiful sunset at the Rad Ranch. And I'm excited. So hopefully you guys spotted some cool stuff inside the shop in there. If not, I'm really thinking, I'm really thinking that I might just pull the old yellow RX-8 in the shop and work on this thing first. What's really crazy, when I first moved to Tennessee was when Johnny bought this thing. And it was the first engine I pulled out in my old shop in Tennessee. But right now, it doesn't exactly need an engine. So you can see I charged the battery. Ready to go. I bought this thing just, you know, you could always need a yellow RX-8. Maybe I'll collect every 04 color of RX-8. I already got probably the hardest ones. But I charged the battery up. And I bet I can have this thing running. Listen to that. I mean, this thing sounds like it makes more compression than my green car does. But it's got to just be something dumb. Probably popped an ignition coil fuse. I haven't even looked at it. Don't even know if I have spark. I literally put a charged battery in it. But I bet I'm going to pull this thing in here. It's going to be first car we work on in the Rad Ranch really quick. And I bet I can have that thing running. Mint. Real fast. If not, I'll pull some parts from the green car and we'll make that one run. And then I'll order whatever I need because the green one can get all the upgrades. So with that, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm excited. You know, the Patreon guys have kind of been seeing this stuff happen as it goes along. So if you're interested in supporting the channel, my Patreon is set up like a question to answer. You become a member of Patreon. You can send me messages. The videos on there answer those questions, whether it's a how should I port my engine to achieve this kind of drivability and power or I want to rent a sys swap a first gen or anything like that. We talk about all sorts of cool stuff on there and I really appreciate those guys' support. But now that we have a safe work environment and insulation and dust and steel isn't falling from the roof, we can get back to working on cars, which is what we set out to do and teaching you guys new stuff in every video. So hopefully you learned something about buildings today. I sure did watching this whole process and I intend to learn some more. And I really appreciate you guys watching the video. So with that, keep it rad. We're gonna see you in the next one. Hey Letty. Come here. Come here. Come here. Hey. Come here. Leave it. Oh, here she comes. Here she comes. Oh, how are you? How are you, huh? Hey. Is that a beautiful sunset? Is that a beautiful sunset? Yeah. Are you digging up moles in the cornfield? Yeah. Oh, you're so excited. Get the zoomies at the end of the video. What? Look at her, throwing roost. What? <laughs> what is that, Letty? Peace, guys.